Well, welcome to the very timely first week of our new Lifehouse series, simply titled, The Final Word. Now, when I think about that phrase, the final word, my mind is taken to so many different movie scenes that I've watched over time where people are gathered together in a real tense environment, lots of voices are being raised at the same time, opinions are being shared here, there and everywhere. And and there comes a moment in that scene where someone stands up or or someone speaks and as they begin, the, the whole crowd noise dies down. Now, sometimes they come with a big, loud, booming voice, a burly voice, a strong voice. Other times they come with a calm voice, a soft voice. But either way, the outcome's still the same. It quiets the entire room as people lean in and listen to what is being said. And there's something unique about that scene. It's like the moment, there's all these voices, but the moment this one single voice is raised, every other voice goes silent. And in that moment, the clear outcome or the direction needs no more opinion, it needs no more discussion, because the final word has been spoken. When we come around uh, the word, as we're going to do over the next six weeks together in this series, simply titled The Final Word, we're going to grow in a deeper revelation of what God's word being the final word means for our lives. We're going to dig into a, a fresh revelation of how to take his word and elevate it in each one of our lives so that it supersedes all other voices, all other opinions, all other perspectives, so that it cuts through all of that and lands in a place that gives the outcome and the decision no need for another voice. So as we begin this series, I want to draw your attention to what Jesus himself said about the words that he would speak. Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, reading from uh, the Passion Translation, it says this, The earth and sky will wear out and fade away before one word that I speak loses its power or fails to accomplish its purpose. In other translations, it says heaven and earth. Basically, it's saying everything that you can see with your natural eye, it will fade away before one word of God ever fails to accomplish the purpose for which it was spoken. I'm telling you here today, we can attach ourselves to the words that God has spoken, build them into our lives and see his purpose live out from us regardless of the season that we are in. You know, all words, all words carry weight, but not all words carry the same weight. All words have the power to influence, but not all words have the same power to influence. Now, in no way do I mean that, uh, you know, having an extensive vocabulary uh, is the answer that you need right now? In no way this, uh, am I saying that this language that I speak, English, having a wide range of terms to be able to use is what you need to be looking for? See, I don't even know the difference in, in using the words of English. I don't know whether to say affect or effect. I don't know. I just use them both interchangeably. Uh, I don't know whether to say I want to go further or farther. I don't know. To me, I just change them. I don't know whether I'm trying to imply or imply something. See, I didn't even get the word right. Imply or infer. Infer or imply. I said someone with a wide, wide range of vocabulary, all right? So obviously that's not me. I don't know whether I'm trying to say regardless or irregardless. Essentially, the point that I'm trying to make here as you receive this is it's not about the words that we use. It's about the actions that connect to the words that determine whether or not they carry weight, whether or not they carry influence, whether or not they carry power. It's not about the word technically that's being used in a grammatical sense as much as it is the life that that word is coming from. You know, the Bible talks a lot about this thing called chaff. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's the little shell 
that is found on the outside of an individual piece grain of wheat. And the Bible says that, you know, it gives us this picture that when our words are not followed up by the actions, and I think if we were honest with each other today, we, we would say not only have we been on the receiving end of words that haven't been followed up on, but we've also spoke words that haven't been followed up on. And the words that uh, uh, come without action, they become like the wind. They just drift away into the space of nothingness. It's like the chaff that I was referring to that surrounds the individual grain of wheat. Uh, When the grain is ready to be harvested, it's taken away and, and in big, large uh, clumps, it's threshed. And that, that means that the grain is actually beaten. So what happens is all of that outer shell that encloses the special bit that we're going for, that bit of grain, it all becomes one together. It be, the, the individual grain comes out, but it's all just there together. So what the next process is for a winnowing grain, this is what it's called, is that the chaff and the seed, the grain, need to be separated. The way that's done is big clumps of this mixed up mess are thrown in the air. And while it's in the air, the wind comes along. And if there is no substance, meaning if there is no weight, the chaff simply gets blown away. While the seeds of grain, they sink back down into the pile that is unusable and achievable. Friends, I want you to know today that when God speaks, he has never spoken a word that can change one iota of chaff. Every word that he has ever spoken is a word that has held substance, held power, held influence. And when we take a hold of that word in our lives, then we become people of substance. We become people of power. We become people of influence. There's this great scripture that's found in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. It's telling a story about a a man named Balaam who is uh, going to a king uh, to prophesy about the nation of Israel. The the king was hoping that he would actually curse them, but God put a word in Balaam's mouth. And when he got to this scene where he's going to deliver the word, this is what Balaam declared. Numbers 23, verse 19. It says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, So he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Friends, that's a good question for us to be asking of ourselves. Has God ever spoken and not failed to act? Has he ever promised something and not carried it through? through? The answer to that question is a resounding no. The moment God speaks, it immediately becomes the final word. Matthew chapter 8 verse 27 I love this in the, in the Passion Translation. The disciples have just, just seen Jesus do something incredible. It says, The disciples were astonished by his miracle and said to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. When he speaks, he cuts through all the noise and obedience in creation is found at the mention, at the mention of his voice, whatever he declares. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honour next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Now the message paraphrase, it expands on this a little bit in a language uh, that gives a great picture of what's taking place here. Let me read it to you. 1 Peter 3.22 in the message, it says, Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone. From angels to armies, he's standing right alongside God and what he says goes. Now here's the thing. Just because what God says goes doesn't mean that he's going to step into a place into our world where he removes that free will that he has designed for each one of us to live by. See, God's actually, by his own authority, placed us into a position where we get to choose. Who are we going to give that final word to? Who are we? If you want to live in the authority 
that God has for you, then it becomes our choice to place ourselves under his authority. Friends, let me tell you this. The moment you place yourself under a certain authority, you get to stand with all of the authority that comes with where you've placed yourself. So today we're talking about not placing ourselves under an authority that comes with a thousand different perspectives, but rather putting ourselves under the authority of the final word and living with the confidence that comes from that place. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. There's power in the promises of God which he has fulfilled and continues to fulfill daily. You know, when God speaks... Every word comes with a consistency of action that shows not only can his word be trusted, but his word actually becomes the sole place where we can build our lives upon that we can have the confidence that is unshakable. Jesus climbed a hill while he was alive on this earth and and spoke to great crowds that had come to listen to his teaching. And if you read the New Testament in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, you read through this incredible teaching Jesus gives as a, basically as a picture of the way to go about living a healthy life with God as the center. And he gets to the end of it, Matthew chapter 7, and he gives this final picture for all those that are listening. And I want to read it to you. And it's found in Matthew chapter 7, right at the end of the chapter, verse 24. He says, everyone who hears my teaching, everyone who hears my words, everyone who hears the final word and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. Jesus' declaration, when you hear it, when you receive it, when you apply it, it becomes an unshakable foundation in your soul. When the rains and the flood came, friends, It's the reality of life. We could describe our situation right now around the world when the rain comes, when the flood comes, when the unpredictable comes. I can't tell you when it's going to rain, when it's not. When the unpredictable happens, fierce winds come and they all beat upon his house. Listen to this. It stood firm because of its strong foundation. But everyone who hears my teaching, and sadly, we've got to read on. This is the reality. Everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can be compared to a foolish man who, when it rained, who built his house upon the sin. My apology. Verse 27. When it rained and rained and the flood came with wind and waves beating upon the house, the same reality, the same unpredictability, the same story. What was the outcome? It collapsed and was swept away. By the time Jesus finished speaking, the crowds were dazed and overwhelmed by his teaching. It literally means they were blown away by what he was communicating to them because his words, listen, carried such great authority, unlike the teachers of the religious law that were there on that day. Jesus' words captivated the hearts and the minds of the people that were there because they carried a weight that came with an action that he was already showing about the love that God had for them. Jesus was not here building his profile. Jesus was on this earth declaring the goodness, the the grace, and the love of God for every single person. And he was honest enough to say, friends, I'm telling you this, you now have the option to choose where you you are going to build your house. Are you going to build it on the unshakable foundation of the truth of my words? Are you going to give me the final word in your life? Or are you going to continue to listen and give a voice to all of the different perspectives out there? Because trust me, there is no shortage of those. And he says, you've got one choice. You've got a very simple one and you've got the power to make it. You can build your life on something unshakable today as you could build it 2,000 years ago when these words were spoken. Think about all the things that we're all faced with making decisions about day by day. Like some of the headlines of that are our our families, our friends, our finances and our futures. They all started with F. It helped me remember them. You know, you think about those things every single day. If you've got children, you're thinking about your children. If you're married, you're thinking about your marriage. You're constantly thinking about your career. Maybe right now more than ever, you're thinking about what the next day is going to bring. We're constantly juggling thoughts in our minds about so many different things. And here's the thing that I know about each one of you. 
All of us together, we all want to make the very best decision, not just for ourselves, but those that we've been given responsibility for. We all want to make the decision that brings about the greatest security for our family and those that we love. And so we listen to the best advice that we can receive. And we lean over this way and we lean over that way. But friends, quite often what happens is we find ourselves leaning to so many different voices. And the thing that I've noticed about other external voices is that they all claim to be the best one. And so we find ourselves in this place of inattention about making the right decision. Now, I want to put your hearts and your minds at ease today, not with anything that I come to offer you, but what with, with what the Word of God says. And it's this. Your security, your confidence, your ability to face the future with a, a boldness and a triumphant spirit, it's not connected to your ability to make the right decision. I know that that's what it feels like. It feels like you're responsible for constantly making the right decision. But friends, if God wanted us to be people who were responsible for constantly making the right decision, he would have sent us an educator that could teach us the way to make the right decision, to always get it right. But he didn't. He sent a saviour because he said, I know you can't always make the right decision, but I'm going to be here and I'm going to save you. And you know what? There is times in each one of our lives when we're going to make catastrophically the wrong decision. And that's when you're going to know more than ever that I am not just here to educate you, to train you. I am here to save you. There's this story in the Old Testament I just want to draw your attention to and comes in the story as the people of Israel were advancing into the space called the Promised Land. It was what God had said that they would inherit as a, as a nation that was set aside for him. And so Joshua is leading the people into the nation and, and God said into this new land and God said to the people, he said, you're going to come into a space where other nations are going to be fearful of you. And so they're going to come and try and make treaties with you and, and gain a place in your, in your new lives. And God said, it's unacceptable. That cannot happen. So we enter this story where a group of people come to do just that. Joshua chapter 9, verse 9. Let me read this to you. They answered, these people who came in, they answered, your servants, Joshua asked them, I should let you know, where have you guys come from? Because they came dressed old and uh, with old clothing and tattered clothing and uh, sandals that were worn out. And so he says, hey, where did you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country. We have heard of the might of the Lord your God and all he did in Egypt. Going down to verse 12, this bread... They're speaking. This bread was hot from the ovens when we left our homes. But now, as you can see, it's dry and moldy. These wineskins were new when we filled them. But now they are old and split open. And our clothing and sandals are all worn out from our very long journey. Now listen to this. So the Israelites examined their food. They looked at the situation as best as they could. They heard the words that were being spoken. They saw what they saw with their own eyes. They investigated it as much as they could. But the very next line says, but they did not consult the Lord. Verse 15, then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their safety. And the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a binding oath. Verse 16, three days after making the treaty, they learnt that these people actually lived nearby. What's the point that I'm making here with this? You know, I just think it's so easy to read an Old Testament story like that and look at Joshua and his leaders and think, well, isn't it obvious isn't it obvious that they should have consulted the Lord? Isn't it obvious that they should have listened to him? Yet, friends, this story isn't about a man that lived centuries ago, millennia ago. This is a story about us. How many times have we found ourselves in a situation where we didn't know the answer to, but we looked at the evidence as best as we could and we made a decision based on that? 
God is calling his church, Lifehouse Church, us again to be a people that no longer lean into what our natural eyes can see, to the evidence that's around us without the revelation of consulting the Lord, without the revelation of saying, I know what this looks like, I know what this sees like, but my revelation isn't based on what my eyes can see. My revelation is the word that God has given me. Romans 10 verse 17 says that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. My faith is connected to a revelation of what God says. So I will not take a step forward without consulting Him. So what do we do with this? Where do we land this today? Do you remember a time in the life of Jesus where He walked into the temple And he found that a space that was set aside for people to pray was being used for a whole other purpose. He he went into the temple and where the place was where people were able to come and relate with him, that's what prayer is, It's, it's an expression of our relationship with God. So he saw a space that was designed for a relationship with God being used to sell uh, things that were necessary. Uh, Things like changing money and selling sacrifice animals that were being used in the day. See, all of those things might have been necessary, but they were never designed to be done in that space. Do you remember what Jesus' response was? He went outside quite calmly. He braided a whip quite calmly. And then in an expression of his almost greatest passion, besides the final expression of going to the cross, Jesus went on a rampage through that temple. We'll call it a righteous rampage, where he threw the money changers, the Bible said, out of that space. He lifted tables. He turned things over. He didn't care for one second what what anyone in that space did. He went on a massive clean out of that space. Have you ever wondered... (laughs) Why Jesus was so passionate about that space, so passionate. The the, the Bible actually says that the disciples remembered after he had done this, they remembered uh, a, a prophetic psalm that David had written saying, passion for his house burns within me. I want to let you know tonight, I want to let you know today, I want to let you know wherever you're watching this from, that God's passion for his house had nothing to do with a physical temple. What he was talking about or showing to us was his passion for people. And Jesus was giving us the clear picture that says, hey, I know you've got a space in your heart. It's a, it's a space that's been designed to meet with me. And I know that all of us at times have had that space encroached upon by the many things that go on in life, necessary things, Get this, necessary things. They were just never designed to take that space that was set apart for relationship. So Jesus, with all of his passion today, is coming into our space right now, wherever you are watching from. And he's reminding, hey, hey, if you will give me the final word, just clear this space out. You've been giving voices to, you've been giving space to some. your, Your soul was never designed to receive from those other things. So Jesus coming in with great passion. He's chucking it out. He's getting rid of it all. It seems extreme, but he's saying, no, trust me, if you will let me clear this, out and you let my voice be the only voice that reigns in this space, then you will know the power, the authority, the grace, the love that comes when I am the final word. 2 Corinthians, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, don't you realize that together you have become God's inner sanctuary and that the Spirit of God makes His permanent home in you. Friends, we are that temple. And our soul is that space that God is destined to rule and reign in so that we might know Him personally, so that we might experience His grace upon our lives day by day. We're in this series. We've launched this thought about the final word. And today I want to ask right across our communities that are joining us in Moree and Northern Beaches and Coffs Harbour and wherever else you might be tuning in from, If you're here watching this right now and you know that you've allowed some other things to come into the space that God designed for him and for his word. Maybe it's around an area of a relationship. 
God has given clear instructions about how we're to honour him in that space and keep ourselves pure and, and, uh, and righteous in that space, obviously covered by his grace, but walking in a certain way. And maybe you've allowed yourself to, to just drift to another voice that says, no, I'm okay, I'm allowed to go this way. Yeah, absolutely, you are allowed to go this way. But friends, we're not talking about what's right and wrong as much as we are talking about who we're giving that final word to. Maybe it's in the space of worry. Seems quite timely, doesn't it? God has consistently, Old and New Testament, called us to be people who would not worry. But maybe we've allowed worry to creep into that space. Today, Jesus would remind you, he's clearing that junk out so that his word can become the final word in your life. Maybe it's in the area of finances. Maybe it's in the area of career, your future. I've mentioned those things already. With your family. Maybe it's fear and and doubt and a, a million other things that it could be for each individual person. What I know is that when we are willing to allow Jesus to enter the space, he'll be the one that does the cleaning out. He'll be the one that does the moving away. And he'll be the one who takes up residence where he is always destined to be in your world. Friend, when we put Jesus Christ in the place where he has the final word, then we also get to stand in the authority and the power of that word spoken over us. And as we're going to discover in the weeks ahead, that Jesus ultimately went to the cross, declared from the cross, it is finished. And with those words, he brought a finality to anything that would stand against you stand against us meeting with him and knowing him as our personal Lord and Savior. This morning, today, wherever you're watching from, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to give you that invitation right now. I'm going to lead us all in a prayer together. And uh, if you, as because we're all watching online, there is going to be an opportunity to respond to this in a way that connects you with one of our pastors, one of our team. And uh, they're going to continue to pray with you after this. So let me lead you in a prayer. Why don't, why don't you just, wherever you are, sitting in whatever lounge room or space, why don't you repeat these simple words after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for what you have done for me. Thank you that all of your words have always come with actions. You've always done what you said you would do. Today, I ask that you would come into my life. Remove all the clutter, every other voice, every other opinion, including my own. I lay it at your feet and I ask that you would take up residence in the place you were always destined to be and be the final word in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless your life, house.